Hi, my name is Connie. Um, I work for the organisation Project Play, who do activities with children that um, are displaced in northern France. Our aim is to ensure that kids uh, have the possibility to play, uh, both because play is a, a human right and also because uh, we use play as a tool to process emotion, to release to toxic stress uh, and to make life a bit easier in such a difficult context. Uh, our days in uh, Calais are uh, uh, very variable. Uh, so in the day we have a morning meeting in which we uh, plan the activities, we choose a theme uh, and we try to like plan uh, specific activities for, for specific locations which would be safe houses, living sites uh, or day centers and uh, we try to adapt uh, the activities for like to keep kids of all ages and all like uh, backgrounds uh, so we have we plan like the crafts we plan uh, free play which is essential because it's a child led, -led play and it's really important uh, because you allow them to express themselves and to uh, develop uh, um, and process their emotions and then we have the funnest moment which is uh, uh, circle time which is a moment in which we all gather in a circle and we play and sing and dance and it's both a way to break the but it's also a way to develop confidence and uh, uh, self-awareness, identity in the kids. And yeah, so the morning we plan all of that. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we all split in different groups and we try to have a continuity in different locations. So for, for example, we aim to go three times a week at the living site, two times a week in the safe houses and three times a week in the day center where most children go like in the afternoon to uh, restore and feel better. And uh, that's it. How did you become involved in this work? I've always been like quite interested in the, um, or I've been like concerned and like felt a lot of empathy and passion about the um, British migration like process and policies towards migrant in the, migrants in the UK are frankly like inhumane. Um, so it's been something that's been like sort of. I've been invested in in a long time and I've worked with um, sector refugees in the UK um, but I had a friend who worked out here for a different organization a kitchen um, who distributed food and she was very um, she was really affected by seeing people living outside here specifically the children um, so I really wanted to sort of come and do what I could in this context um, because it is like it's on our doorstep this is the result of policy that our government puts in place, um, that children live in tents and that children are violently evicted from tents every 24, 48 hours by police and continue to suffer like continued trauma and instability in first world countries. What's the sort of age range of children that you're seeing and that you tend to work with? So there are children of all ages, like it's a very like changing context and things change the whole time and uh, it's very unpredictable uh, but I would say like since I've been here which has been since December we've worked with kids from like uh, two months old or three months old until like 16, 17 so minors more than kids. Are some of the children or, or many of the children living um, in temporary shell like tents and yeah. Shelters. yeah 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 especially in, in winter time uh, luckily we saw very few children at the living site but we know that there are children and there are children we've seen them and uh, despite the fact that many of them live in safe houses there is not enough room or capacity to host all of them so the majority of the kids lives in living sites in temporary shelters and they're exposed uh, apart from to terrible weather conditions and they've been experiencing the ice, the cold, the floods. Uh, they're also exposed to police brutality and they're a victim of like traumatic events which add up add on top of all the other uh, traumatic and unbearable situations they live. Uh, so yeah, definitely there are, I think the majority of the kids live in, in you know, temporary sites uh, and they're evicted by um, like quite often uh, even though in winter there have been temporary shelters such as like a big gymnasium opened and most of the number of people there are some families like hotels offered by the state but it's never enough and it's always a very temporary solution so eventually we'll go back to the living state. Part of what our organization does is um, safeguarding. There's very few organizations 
to be honest, if any other ones in Calais right now where um, volunteers or um, coordinators such as myself are one on one with children or in a safe space with children, which allows them to disclose things to us that they aren't able to disclose maybe when their families are around or um, in just in the presence of a lot of adults. So um, we track and help in cases where we suspect human trafficking, um, sexual exploitation um, and any other um, safeguarding concerns. We are like the the primary, if not one of the primary organisations that helps to combat these issues because the government is negligent in this area, if not complicit. Um, and then in addition to this, we we provide essentially like one of the only times of the day for these children to actually be children um, because they aren't able to live here. They are just surviving, um, surviving from day to day, um, continually being moved on by police and not knowing when they're going to cross and when they will get their next meal or their next pair of dry shoes. Um, so to just be able to be children is, um, it should be a human right, but for these children, that is like a, a special thing that they that they get, and it's essential that we provide that space for them. So I'm a um, coordinator for safeguarding in uh, child protection. So basically, in Project Play, we have five coordinators. Each one has like focusing on one thing, and then uh, so since we try to provide like safer space for the kids, and we are like so often um getting disclosures from the kids or like we try to detect like some cases that might be happening about like trafficking um sexual abuse neglection etc so in your safeguarding work then if you have a concern about a child what what process do you follow to yeah so yeah as we said we don't have unfortunately like a lot of supports from authorities or french um actors uh so we try to cooperate between organizations a lot of times we work so much together with the women's center um they are also um registered as french organizations so they also have the social worker and they work with women so it's a lot of times perfect because uh then we can match with all the family and when we get information from both sides and then together we try to decide if it's something to report to the authorities and if it's not gonna cause more harm than than good basically i think like until you until because the media in the uk conveniently turns a blind eye to what's going on here they like to pretend that you know it's just um single adult men who are trying to cross to the uk for economic reasons like it's families that are fleeing war it's mm -hmm. young children fleeing war and it's unaccompanied 16 17 sometimes 15 year olds mm -hmm. fleeing war including girls i've met unaccompanied women um women they're 16 um who are incredibly vulnerable the children ever talk about the older children talk much about their aspirations or is it just they just want to get to the next stage i guess like i i think for children like especially when we're talking about young children this is so out of their hands like it's not their choice frankly to come to the uk um it's not even really their parents choice their arms have been twisted because they're fleeing war or they're fleeing persecution um so and maybe the UK is the only place where they can speak the language because of our colonial history or the only place where they might have family and friends. So, of course, if I was fleeing the UK, I think I'd choose America or Australia <laughs> because I can't speak very good in other languages. Um, but the children, like, to be honest, they're, the place they would like to be is home. <laughs> they just can't, you know, like. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, like, career aspirations, um sometimes we've done we do a theme every week one week we did a theme on um careers to try and help promote this idea of um self-growth and self-development and thinking positively about the future because when you're just faced with trauma after trauma or negative experience after negative experience a lot of these children don't appear to have like big future aspirations like children in the uk do um so we're trying to help them develop those positive excitement and feelings about the future. 
So you're the Refugee Women's Centre, and how would you describe the work you do? I think to summarise, we work on the border between France and the UK. So we operate mainly in Calais and in uh, Dunkirk um, with women and families that are on the move. Um, and so I think in terms of activities, we do mainly three things. So we do uh, material support, we do psychosocial support, and then we do, so I think, um, some form of um, maybe activism, if that's the way to call it. So the material support is to um, sort of um, help to match the basic needs of the people we support and we work with. So that would be distributing maybe clothes, uh, because we work specifically with women. It can be also hygienic products that are quite hard to get a hold on, um, especially in this context. Um, and then maybe if they need um, support to um, have things to sleep, uh, we also facilitate if they need access to um, accommodation, emergency accommodation. Yes, we also do um, psychosocial support. Um, so we organize activities with um, women and families, um, or sometimes when there's families with, with, with um, other organizations, such as Project Play, uh, which um, plays with children. Um, so it can be um, artistic workshops, or just sharing a cup of tea, spending some time together, uh, we also facilitate access to showers. For all the people that are uh, on the move, uh, everybody is sleep uh, sleeping in a living sites, so in informal settlements where they don't find access to shelter, where they don't find access to water, they don't find access to to all the the the, the fundamental rights are not are not respected uh, for them. So for everybody, the situation is uh, is super hard. They are living in precarious condition, extremely precarious condition. But for women and for families, uh, for women and for children, uh, they can face uh, additional uh, difficulties and struggle based to the gender and based to the age. So for that, uh, Women Center will try to uh, to facilitate access to different uh, services, so shelter, uh, medical support, uh, access to information, legal support as well, because we know that uh, women and children will have specific needs in a, based based on the, the gender and based on the based on the age. So yeah, we do advocacy uh, in the in the social media, but as well uh, calling the authorities to to try to find shelter, to open shelter. Uh, but as well uh, facilitate uh, the, the the medical access because uh, usually there is no translator, for example. So it's uh, it's a matter of uh, how the woman can get the information about their own health. So yeah, we do we do a different uh, type of advocacy. How did you become involved in this work that you're doing? I always been uh, aware as a French citizen of the situation uh, in Calais. I didn't, mo I didn't know much about the uh, Dunkirk situation because it's not really a um, uh, highlight on the news. Um, so I wanted to get involved uh, along people uh, with people on the move. Uh, and for me, it was important to join a feminist organization because uh, because I'm a, I'm a woman as well, and I, I wanted to to support as well uh, other women because I know they can face uh, they can face different uh, difficulties and uh, by being on the move. So yeah, I found the, the women's center, and I, I became uh, I became one of the coordinators in uh, in 22. Um, and before 22, I was uh, I was uh, working in a, a shelter for women and for children. I know the house of hospitality that is uh, that is in Calais, uh, and it's one of a one of our main uh, partnership with uh, women's center right now. How would you describe a day, a typical day's work? Well, I think I would say to start with that there's probably no no typical day, mm. <laughs> and that because we respond and have to be re reactive and responsive to people's needs to the situation on the field, which can be you know affected by lots of different factors, up to and including the weather, the you know this political situation, the presence of police, how many families, women there are on the field, what time of year it is. What stuff do we have to sort out in our stockroom and warehouse? You know, um, th there's lots of things that can affect it. But I, and there are lots because we do so many different kinds of work. Uh, I would say there's probably no like t t typical day, but um, uh, because we we uh, the volunteers live in two shared houses, uh, and so we kind of have a sort of convivial start. Where we all come to the warehouse together in the morning which is very nice um we usually do um, we pack orders 
for um, uh, women and families who have asked us for specific things that they would that they, they would like or need. Um, and then uh, two teams go out, one to Kelly, one to Consent, where we do a combination of um, visiting, living sites, going to the uh, the distribution sites that are uh, organized by the, the other associations, um, uh, visiting individual women, uh, going to um, day centers, to the hands of hospitality, um, and es essentially um, meeting people, seeing who's new, meeting people who we've had been in, um, in relationship with for some time, um, and uh, yeah, basically connecting with each other, trying to sort of solve problems, link up people to associations and link up associations to one another. Um, and then also when we're not rushing around and doing, um, you know, getting things and taking people to places, trying to have a bit of human contact and connection and trying to do fun stuff and stuff that's um, uh, culturally meaningful, so self-care and... Um, activities like uh, we had some amazing henna um, activities uh, and uh, it can be sort of both quite uh, connecting and um, meaningful and a bit of a, a rest in the day when usually both we as volunteers and the women and families themselves uh, we're all out in this, you know, quite harsh environment. Them, obviously, with the, you know, being the people who are facing the brunt of, you know, in the in this winter, kind of the harshness of of the Calais and Dunkirk environment. Um, but but yeah, I think we kind of do this mixture of um, practical stuff and um, sort of personal, in interpersonal. Um, work with with the women and families we work with which is a nice balance actually is there a sense that there's a moment where you suddenly feel like maybe you've gained somebody's trust where I imagine on first contact and um, when somebody doesn't know you at all but they meet the first for the first time and it can take a while to like see somebody become more trusting depending what they've been through or how does how does that fit? I mean, is that is that something that you think about, or like? Um, I mean, I I would say please chip in. <laughs> yeah. Um. I I I think we we definitely think about it, and obviously, you know, we're working across this very unequal dynamic. Uh, as a person who has UK citizenship, like sometimes people find it. Incompre and I find it personally incomprehensible that um, you know I'm able to to cross with relative ex extreme ease mm. compared with you know these 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 people who are really struggling and trying to work out a way to get across the channel. Um, and I think that we always have to bear in mind the intersectional quality of you know, just the oppressions at play. Um, but then also, I think that over over time, and also putting putting this thing of, um, yeah, real connection and humanity and sisterhood foremost, uh, you do get to have the, I think, great great honour, actually, of, of gaining people's trust and confidence and, you know, um, being able to relax together and laugh together and have something that, that feels very much in, in contrast to the harshness and oppressiveness mm. of the, the hostile environment, which I kind of, as a, again, as a British person who works on the other side of the channel in, in um, with with exiled persons of people who are in the asylum system, it's very much a, an extension of of our hostile environment, um, and you know, fortress Europe. It's it feels like this we're doing something in opposition to that, which is very special. Um, so the Refugee Women Center is uh, fundraised by a different organization, non governmental organization. So there is 
la Fondation Abbé Pierre, euh, Caritas, la Fondation de France, la Fondation de Femmes, euh, la Fondation Raja. So there is like different, uh, different foundation, Halea Foundation as well. But we, we do receive as well um, uh, donations from particular, uh, particular donors. In uh, 22, we receive uh, a prize from the Women UN, uh, a prize of resilience. Uh, which uh, didn't really help us in terms of fundings, but uh, help us to gain a lot of uh, visibilities on the, um, and then uh, stabilities uh, as well later. He, stabilities in term in terms of uh, building partnership uh, in a long term partnership with different foundations. So we do use the money uh, to provide a direct support for the women, which means uh, uh, buying a lot of uh, material supplies lot of tents, a uh, sleeping bag, as well as uh, clothes, for example, uh, we distribute only new underwear for the women. Um, we facilitate access to shelter, so with the money we can uh, pay a uh, hotel night, uh, as well as food, and uh, as well uh, uh, psychosocial activities by buying material to, uh, yeah, as you were describing before, do a, a henne, or do a cooking session, or do a, a sport session with, uh, with the women. So the, the fund I, I used for uh, to support uh, to support directly the, the women on the on their on their children, uh, as well uh, human resources uh, and as well the the to support the team of the volunteers because our team uh, is uh, is based of uh, on uh, on a team of volunteers coming from different countries so we can provide uh, housing. And uh, because we are a mobile team, uh, we need to uh, like most a lot of our funds are used to pay the fuel and to pay the different uh, car. Online. Yeah, what are the essential resources that you need to operate your work, your day to day work? So we need a lot of uh, materials, and uh, some materials are difficult to find into into donations. So sometimes we need we need to do call out for it. So we we will need to have a lot of uh, tents, um, tents with uh, two layers because uh, we are in the north of France and the uh, the weather is usually bad. So a tent that can resist to the to the wind and to the rain and things like that. Um, sleeping bags because uh, people are sleeping outside. In terms of clothes, uh, we will need mostly joggings. These are really hard to find in, in a donation. And uh, when we give clothes, uh, I think it's always important to remind that it needs to be a clothes adapted for the life outside. Um, so sports clothes that uh, will be easy to dry, mm -hmm. will be uh, uh, elastic, yeah. will be waterproof, windproof. Um, on the on the clothes uh, that uh, is uh, easy to fit for for all sizes. That's why we ask for jogging because obviously there is no place to try if the jean if a jean is in the right size or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we do distribute distribute always clean uh, new new underwear. Um, it's important to remind that the women and the children in the camp doesn't doesn't have access to. Uh, to showers, to uh, clean water, to a place to wash the clothes, besides uh, what uh, women's center and other organization can support. So that's why uh, distributing new underwear and uh, as well as hygienic supplies is really important for the health, but as well for the dignity of the women. Um, we do need as well a telephone and power bank for the people to, to remain in contact with their uh, families, but as well to the uh, uh, emergency number, if something happens on the sea or in the camp, and as well with uh, the, the organization that operates. Um, if a single woman doesn't have a, doesn't have a telephone, for example, it would be more difficult for us to enter in contact uh, with, with her. And, uh, and yes, it's important that everybody have, have a phone on the internet credit. Uh, we do need as well um, uh, baby milk, baby powder milk. Uh, it's uh, something that costs uh, cost a lot, but there, there is a lot of uh, uh, babies uh, and young children in the, in the living site. So we need, uh, this is something that we are looking for as well. What are the kind of patterns that you see in people arriving? Um, so where are they? Um, where do they tend to arrive from? Um, what um, is it? Certain times of the year when more people arrive, like when the weather is warmer. Um, 
and um, yeah, and the kind of languages that you're speaking and mm-hmm. kind of things like that. You mentioned translation before as well, which I think yeah. is can be difficult sometimes when somebody needs like medical yeah. assistance to be able to just explain what the problem is. Or... Yes. <laughs> um, so the communities that uh, that we support uh, come from um, different countries, uh, but mainly uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, and the uh, Kurdish people as well. Uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Bidoun. These are the main communities. Uh, Often there will be uh, uh, another families, but these are the main communities that uh, we will meet in Calais and in Dunkirk. Um, over like every year, uh, the Refugee Women's Center meets about uh, 5,000 uh, members of family, which includes uh, about 2,000 women and about 2,000 children as well. Uh, there is more women and family over the summer because the you know, living outdoor is a little is a little bit less harsh than in the winter and there is more opportunity to cross as well uh, by small boats in the UK so we we tend to support way more people uh, over the the good uh, over the summer and spring and autumn in the winter is a little bit uh, more uh, more calm but there is still a lot of uh, people in, in the camp a lot of, lot of the women that we meet and a lot of the women that we support travel with families. However, there is as well a lot of single women, as much as a single mother with very young uh, kids. Um, sometimes we meet um, either women or even children that would speak maybe, well, very often English, but also sometimes German, because mm-hmm. as uh, Marie said, they, their journey is much longer than the time we've known them. So a lot yeah. of them have been through other countries before. Yeah. So, yeah, so it happens that maybe they would speak other languages that um, people on the team would speak um, or that could maybe facilitate yeah, mm-hmm. the, the communication. And also, at least in my experience, uh, children very often speak very good English, the ones I've met. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but as Marie said, we always also try to... Um, to use the translator when we want to specifically talk with women because maybe um, going through the children isn't the the best way to communicate with them about certain issues. So we try to have this direct relationship with them. um, And if we need to use a translator, then we do. Yeah. I mean, it is really, it's really amazing to meet these hyper articulate, like um, multilingual kids who kind of almost take this head of the family role and kind of but also you know you think that they have also lost out on being able to have a child a childhood mm-hmm. um, and so it's uh both awe inspiring and um yeah a bit bittersweet mm-hmm. um yeah. yeah but i mean it really in terms of as a as a native english speaker with otherwise very sluggish language skills it has been amazingly uh or inspiring and humbling to see people kind of range through their different the different languages they have access to. So maybe you want to try and speak a lot more French. <laughs> um, we can facilitate sort of um, maybe relationships between sort of medical prof- like medical practitioners and and peoples. For example, this morning uh, we had an appointment. Well, there was someone we were supporting that had an appointment, so we can we went to pick her up to bring her. Um, to the facility uh, where she could do the test that she had to do. So we do do this. Um, and then I think on the field, there's other organizations that we work with. I think the Red Cross uh, is in Dunkirk. I'm not sure about the ones in Calais. The Red Cross as well, the uh, border without, the medical without border, Médecins du Monde. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Red Cross, FAST, uh, and as well the, the hospital, the, the state, uh, the state uh, healthcare hospital. Mm-hmm. And I think um, because, as Josie mentioned, um, or I think maybe in your question, um, maybe sometimes the the people we um, support um, have maybe trust us. So I know that, like, um, I haven't had this experience, but that sometimes um, it can also um, take the shape of going with them to some appointments, maybe to the gynecologist or... Uh, if uh, they're pregnant and, and have doctor's appointment to just make sure that um, they also uh, are given or are translated all the information that they should have to also empower them about you know their own body and what they decide um, to do. 
Yeah, I had the experience of taking someone to hospital this week, actually, and um, it was it was really nice to be able to be sort of a bridge between the person who was receiving medical care and the medical system in France, which, you know, it very much has the reputation of being the best in the world, etc. Um, which and it's very it's like extremely well equipped and beautifully orderly and well funded, um, but it is also quite heavily fortified. It's very administrative, and I think people do experience it as uh, as an encounter with the authorities which in this context is something that kind of is it sets off alarm bells for people because there are other uh, experiences with the border force with the police mm -hmm. um, and they're usually often quite violent and, and oppressive and so yes give, uh, sort of facilitating this access to institutional medical care um, is it feels like quite an important a uh, piece of our work going and um, speaking to receptionists and doctors and helping with paperwork and and actually also giving some of the some of the emotional support and just kind of backing up and uh, you, you feel so um, a bit of lending one's privilege in that way in in that context um, yeah it's quite quite surprising actually what 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 difference you know uh, being there feels that it makes I think it's important to know as well that over the free last year, uh, more than half a billion of euro was uh, was spent just on the border, not to give shelter to people, mm -hmm. not to protect people, but to to harass, to evict, to 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 yeah to stop the people coming here. All the all the public policies uh, in Calais and Dunkerque are based on uh, fighting against the uh, pull factor. Which is the idea that uh, if uh, if uh, refugees, if uh, people on the move uh, find, are are well welcome here, uh, they will be more numerous. There will be uh, there will be more and more people coming. Mm -hmm. It's a theory that has been never proved scientifically, and uh, over the years we see that it is not working. Over the years, the the, the condition in the living site are becoming more and more difficult, and with uh, more state violence, more police violence, less and less access to the basic needs. Every day in the living site, uh, there is a police force expulsion, which means that uh, uh, the police is coming to set up a perimeter where the the people on the move cannot enter. That means they cannot take their own belongings. Mm -hmm. So the police will uh, will take everything: the tents, uh, the, uh, the sleeping bags, the the personal items of the of the people. So it's stealing the personal belongings of the people. Um, what is the most uh, uh, um, uh, hard and difficult is when uh, the the people on the move are losing a backpack where there is medicine, where there is ID, where there is ordinance like medical paper. Uh, which really put them in like terrible situation later on. Mm. Uh, so in Calais, there was eviction every every two days. In uh, Grand Saint, in Dunkerque, the eviction are every week. And uh, yeah, that's that's one of the strategy of the of the state to uh, make the living condition harder to try to discourage the people to come. It doesn't work. It just makes the life of the people harder, and uh, the people are living in harder and harder living condition, and they are taking more and more risk to cross to the UK. And they are not crossing directly from the beach of, of Calais or Dunkerque, but they are going more and more further from the coast. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, there is more and more people dying at the border. It's it's a border that is killing people. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that we give out to people that we distribute are replenishing, replacing mm -hmm. the possessions that have been confiscated or destroyed by the police. So, you know, tents that have been beaten up, um, uh, broken phones, you know, people who are left with no clean clothes or clean underwear, as well as the important medical documents and, you know, other important things, electronics and papers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like one of the the goal of Refugee Women Center is to create a safe space for for women and for children, and into this this safe space, which uh, sometimes is just our car with our volunteers, yeah. like female volunteers, uh, where the people that we support uh, will identify us as a person you can talk about any woman issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it can, it can be anything, including uh, health, pregnancy, uh, gender-based violence, and things like that. 
um, us, we will try to identify always the, the family composition of the person. Is she isolated? Is she traveling alone? Is she traveling with a group of friends? Is she a single mother? Is she pregnant? Does she, does she have any disabilities? And because we will observe uh, all this, um, this, uh, this thing, we will try to adapt our, our follow-up. We will try to adapt our response to her situation. Mm. If we if we meet a single woman uh, that is not traveling with uh, other member from the same community, we will try to, um, uh, to 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 give her access to a shelter in priority than other people. Mm -hmm. uh, if we find a single mother with uh, very young children for for who it's difficult to travel back and forth mm -hmm. from different state shelter to the camps and so on, uh, we will try to try to provide the shelter as mm -hmm. well. Um, we are always aware of uh, the gender-based violence that uh, the women can face on the living sites on the camp, which is a place where they, it's uh, male-dominated. So we are aware that that uh, women can face uh, uh, different uh, uh, different things. So theft, um, uh, forced uh, sex work, uh, coercition. Um, so we will always try to identify in which situation she is and try to ask um, just are you okay? Like mm -hmm. try to have an, a look on on those uh, those person all the time, and uh, it's not the same person. It's not the same volunteers all the time on the on the field, but we do follow up and we do communicate a lot as as a team to try to follow the situation of the woman as best as we can. It it must be hard not to have a sense of attachment to people where you may have got to know them over a few weeks, maybe months, I don't know, and then. But their their plan is to try and cross into the UK, and and you know that's dangerous, and they know that's dangerous, and then it must it must be a big conflict for you, I guess. I think that it's kind of completely out of your hands that situation, but you but you've also built up the kind of relationship with people. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that one, but I just it, it, it's something that I when I've been talking to people here and um, and also talking to um, some of the refugees that um, it's very it's very hard to to comprehend it really that that they out of desperation they will take the highest risk mm -hmm. to get into another country where. Like you said, it's very easy for us to travel abroad. We have the freedom to travel, and yeah, don't know how how do you, how do you deal with that conflict? Or how? But first, of all, I I would like to highlight that uh, the communities that we the, we support uh, come from a, a country where there is a, is a dictator, war, like extremely difficult situation. So that they are they are flying the country. Um, they they don't have the opportunity of having. Uh, a life of freedom, a secure life, a life where they can live peacefully with their families. Um, so they flee. They are fleeing from terrible situation, um, and then they come. They come uh, until Calais, like alone, like with their own. Uh, like the whole journey was uh, was was by themselves, you know. So. Um, the point of view that women center will have uh, uh, to this woman is seeing them as uh, extremely, extremely resilient women. So we, we we don't try to, uh, yeah, we don't see them as as a, as a victim, as a vulnerable people. Like now, we, we see them as a, like powerful and very strong women, and that's really something that we can uh, we can testify. Like meeting them every day on, on the field, like it's it's uh, it's really obvious uh, for for us. So um, talking to some of them, uh, they are the, they are themselves the most aware of how dangerous is it to cross the channel. Most of the families are crossing by a small boat. Since the since the last thirty years, uh, there is minimum uh, four hundred people that uh, have died into into the border of French uh, French and UK. They are the most aware uh, of that. Um, but according to the journey that they come from, like at home, there was a lot of people dying during the journey crossing the Mediterranean. There was a lot of people dying. Um, Calais and Dunkerque is, uh, for some of them, the last, uh, 
the last part of, of the journey of, uh, of, of migration. And they are just hoping to find a safe space, a safe home, uh, a country where they will have all the freedom that they should have. So, yeah, they are, they are just waiting, waiting for this thing. So yes, we we are aware of of uh, of the risk that they can uh, they can have. What we do as a team as well is uh, prevention to reduce the risk of uh, of crossing. So we give information about uh, uh, when is the good uh, weather condition to cross to the UK. Uh, what are the best clothes to wear? Uh, what are the emergency number to call if you have a problem mm -hmm. on the sea? Um, but we do not interfere of. Uh, Telling them what to do. They are adults. Yeah. They are totally responsible of their own life, and they are yeah, just trying to seek a better life. And mm -hmm. this is something that uh, working in solidarity with women is something we do support and we do we do yeah advocate for. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank and you. And I think as uh, Marie mentioned before, the fact that um, there's this sort of intersectional feminist um, approach in the organization also means that we are here to support them. But as you said, we don't see, we don't place them in a position where they like we don't we don't want to see them as victims mm -hmm. because that's not how we interact with them. And as Josie said, we have this chance to be able to have the these relationships with them through the work that we do. Yeah. So it's really about supporting them and trying to yeah see what we can do to support them. Um, yeah, in in the in their journey. Mm -hmm. I think anybody coming with a, uh, this, an attitude of saviorism would be disabused of that immediately upon meeting <laughs> the yeah. women who, who are here. Because, yeah. um, you know, I, I think they're what? unbelievably, um, I don't know, well, resilient and well, well informed about mm -hmm. well much, much, much more so, I think, than, than I was when I, when I came in here, despite, you know, feeling that, oh, someone who works in this context, I kind of, I feel like I kind of know what situation is. I think actually being here and being with the, the women we work with, it, it gives an entirely different sense for me of actually what the reality of making these crossings yes. is like and what is, what is the political reality What's the emotional reality and what it requires from somebody internally to, mm -hmm. to do this stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I will say that also being able to provide people with the information about, you know, uh, from from sort of uh, authorities' perspective, like how, making a safe crossing, is is really I feel like that's an important part of our work is being able to kind of reinforce the information that I think is given by a lot of different people and also sometimes you know being able to give you know good good clothes to make mm -hmm. crossing which are you know very long and challenging and emergency blankets and hand warmers that makes a difference to yeah. me to feel that mm -hmm. we have we've contributed positively to that and giving them uh, like giving the women and the families uh, concrete information about uh, about uh, the safe passage uh, is a matter of empowerment because then they will be able to take the decision if they want to go on the boat or not. They will not be. Uh, they will. They won't have to just obey blind blindly to a smuggler or someone who will help them, help them to cross. They will be able to take the decision. The uh, if uh, yes or not, I go tonight on this boat uh, because they will be able to read the razor. So they, yeah, it's a matter of empowerment because they will be able to take this, their own decision. Yeah, thank you. That is the bad problem here. It's the eye we are in the sea. We curse the dark meander. He's he's made the police. He's beat my mom. He beat my dad. He's smoking. But he made it to me. Look. He made that me species. The police take it. Yes, this is bad problem. Just take look, look. It's all my fault. Bre 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 me on go beach. Day. We did stay with my mom beach. 
Why this is not? It's not good. This, I need to speak to him. You, you need to help us. You need to come in France and take, say him, say. Brahmo Royce, you must leave the All the, they all go because not us. Me and my brother, my mom is daddy. Maria Skopsova is it's a house I really love. Uh, it's it's a so it's first and foremost. I mean, it's a shelter like for mostly women and children, um, either single women or women with children. And sometimes, if possible, kind of conditions permitting, uh, whole families together. But it's it's a small small house in um, in Calais. It's a place where women can come uh, for as long a time as they need. Um, sometimes it's just for a couple of days, more often for a few weeks, even up to yeah, months. Sometimes, sometimes there's been people that have stayed even up to a year. Um, so for me, it's it's a the kind of sp special part about it is that like I think sometimes people on the move can be so separated from. Um, I mean, from people in France here, or I mean, in the West in, in, in general. And for me, it's a place where people share life together a bit. I mean, even from different cultures, even other people from, mm -hmm. from Iran, from Eritrea, Sudan, um, Afghanistan. Like, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a place where people eat together, we take care of the, the house together. Um, a lot of times people taking care of each other yeah. together too. It's always kind of tough to talk about vulnerability, but I mean, the idea of the house of Marisco Sova is to try to welcome the people that are the most vulnerable. Um, so the way that we've kind of understood that um, is especially, yeah, especially women and, and children um, have, have particular, particular needs and can be can be more vulnerable um, to you know, certain pressures uh, from, and, and even just, you know, just living outside. I mean, there's, there's often kids, I mean, that'll arrive at the house and be sick from being in, in the cold and, and stuff like this, but also I mean, thinking about the, the trauma that the children face from, from the experience of moving across borders and, uh, and facing this kind of, dangers to, to try to create a, a safe a, a place as possible to kind of minimize the, uh, to hopefully minimize the effect of trauma like that. Yeah. And what does a typical day look like in a house? Like you, you, I imagine as you described people are cooking and yeah. I think you do um, and there's, there's, you have volunteers there maybe teaching language to children. Yeah. What, what kind of activities are yeah. happening in the house? So this is kind of a famous question for uh, uh, kind of laugh at it together as, as volunteers because a lot of times you know family and friends will ask like you know what's your typical day look like, but they're kind of in one way there is no typical day because like things can change so fast just depending on like the needs of of people or you know quite often I mean, people have to go to the hospital for different reasons or or there's different uh, activities that. Um, well, I mean, like the, one of the main kind of central things, at least, is is having at least one meal together. So usually dinner will take everybody all together, and this can be like a an important moment to well, even when you have different cultures in the house, for people to to know each other and to care about each other, and even to it helps so much to um, for people to be able to support each other well. Um, so yeah, sometimes there'll be like right now in the house there there's volunteers giving giving English classes, and I think it'll continue with another another person from around Calais once uh, this volunteer leaves. Um, there's well for the for the volun well like the so Maria Skopsova is is a Christian community, so we do have kind of a rhythm of like we'll wake up as volunteers and pray together. And if people in the house there's some people in the house that would like to join, they're very welcome to, but it's really really not. Mm -hmm. uh, obligatory at all or it's uh completely free and in like we welcome yeah from you know, christian orthodox or muslims or of no faith and, and like it's not um it's not at all something that stops us from uh, from being connected together but that that helps us a little bit just to have, as volunteers to have a little moment of 
silence and to breathe and to reflect in a place where there's a lot of uh, action and yeah. kind of need for response to to emergencies. Yeah. I was fortunate to be invited to the house, and mm-hmm. it was it's just beautiful. It's um, yeah, it was very moving. So I, oh, uh, we're fortunate. Feel, that. Yeah, I feel very privileged um, for that, and I'll uh, remember. Yeah, we're fortunate uh, to have you there too. The yeah, place. I mean, every, that's the thing is every person who comes to the house, they bring a little something different. It's just kind of having, it's mostly like being present, you know, so like everybody has their own presence that like we share with each other. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, especially it's nice to, nice to share a meal together. It can be kind of a, something yeah. special. Yeah, it's like you said, it, it can be quite, um, it, when I came to the house, it was quite crowded, and but in a nice way that there were yeah. um, children running around and playing and um and adults cooking and yeah. Yeah, there's um, definitely life in the house yeah um it, it, it just immediately it gives you uh, it, it's kind of just it yeah it just it just forces you to uh to see that we're all the same anyway we just we just well, it's just it's like it's just like a family yeah it's um yeah we talk, i mean a lot of times people yeah talk about this kind of familial Thing. And I think, yeah, that's where you feel it. I mean, we're a part of a bigger human family. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's easier to feel when you've got someone right in front of you. Or, mm-hmm. I mean, it's always these personal connections. At least for me, that was what was transformative or changed a lot a lot for me is, is uh, having this, this opportunity for these connections. Um, can I ask you about the, the way it's funded and stuff? Like, what's the... Um, it feels like... An, from an outside point of view, not understanding the, the ins and outs of the funding, it feels like a, a fragile, hmm. safe haven. Like how do you how do you maintain it? How do you? Ah, uh, well, that, that's the thing is that like it, it's something that we do. I mean, we rely on on support from people outside, and, and oftentimes that's why it's been interesting to talk to you too, because oftentimes I don't know exactly who these people are. I mean, we're very are grateful and I feel kind of connected to them. Um, but so our house, especially like, um, I think there's some, you know, some projects or associations or something that like try to get, you know, a big chunk of money in a grant or from these big kind of foundations or something, but we have never, uh, never, never done that. Um, we've relied just on the like personal donations from, mm-hmm. from people who care and who, you know, want to support this, uh, this work. Um, so I think, from what I've understood, a lot of a lot of donations do come from from the UK. Mm-hmm. For me, I, just like volunteers, a lot of times they come through personal connections of just hearing somebody else who volunteered. I think a lot of times it's just people who've heard from somebody else, and yeah. and uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a it's a like a lot of things in the house. It's a, it's kind of an act of trust that uh, yeah. things will yeah, yeah will be there. And but so far, so far, it's it's yeah, house has continued, and I, I yeah. Trust. You mentioned that you, this this obviously maintenance work that needs doing in the house to yeah. repair. Yeah, <laughs> like, they you mentioned the plumbing and stuff like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so always things are... you know, people um, that may be interested in um, helping by funding you, mm. um, I guess there'll be some people that will think, well, I can, uh, I like the sound of, you know, I know that I can help, you know, make a difference to people and right. um, just bringing children out of the cold and, and their, and their, families um you know just to just to give them that just that moment that space to just feel um to be in a normal situation like a you know like yeah, a more normal yeah yeah like, like a to, yeah yeah not not just surviving you know like yeah. so because that's the thing you hear from people too is like even for reflecting about what's the next step for them and what's what's the good thing for them mm-hmm. it's really hard to do that when you're worried about what you're going to eat and where yeah. you're going to get water and when you're when you're looking for yeah, basic kind of getting out of the snow and the rain. Um, so I, I think I think the house can be that too. It's a, it's a place yeah. where, well, and even just like yeah, sharing these kind of positive moments together. I think it can it can do a lot even for our brains to feel secure when we're having people signal to each other mm. with our faces like you know, there's positive social interactions that oh, it's safe. It's okay to let your guard down a little bit, mm-hmm. and we can you know get to know each other and it's um, and it's very cold right now it's hailing it's the it's icy and yeah oh, I mean, this, this winter has been been rough with a lot of uh 
days below zero, it's been snow, it's, it's floods for weeks and weeks on end. And like, we don't we don't want to be in this kind of like in a charity sense of just trying to like uh, dole out like palliatives if, if that makes sense yeah. but to to try to speak to the the injustice of the situation that people i mean refugees uh, people on the move are are put in um so and and i think i think the houses are really um an important place for that too, because I think that it's it's a place where you know, where these kind of two worlds can connect, both on like kind of very local level that having people instead of people being pushed to the outside of the the city and trying to be made invisible. I mean, we we know our neighbors and the neighbors know know the people in the house and they come with you know with tomatoes and and with a like a, a take made out of nappies for a newborn baby, you know, like there's these touching, touching moments. I think like on a very local level, there's that kind of advocacy. We do try, there are, are different journalists that they ask to, to come to the house. I mean, we try to be very careful and to make sure that people in the house, it's just when people really want to speak. Cause I think the best thing is always that like we can amplify the voices of the people who are actually having the, the experience of, um, of being displaced uh, um, of exile uh, so I mean there's kind of different ways that we, uh, we try to do it and we've got uh, yeah do you see any change in um, kind of the general general opinion on um, accepting refugees and, and mm. improving the situation between countries the, the borders so that uh, it seems, it? Yeah, it seems like in this moment we're in a, a a period of reaction where like lots of countries are deciding to be even less welcoming than they already are, which is, I mean, especially in in, in Europe and, and the UK, it's such a small fraction. You know, uh, there's 110 million displaced people worldwide, and uh, I don't know if it's one or two percent or something come in Europe, but there's a lot of like talk about oh we can't welcome everyone, but are, are we trying? You know, I mean that's that's a bit my my question. So I mean, in this kind of political way, it seems like it seems like it's more important more now than than ever before that mm. yeah that we we stand together and stand alongside people in exile or people that are, are displaced. Um, I know I still still see a lot of uh, well I mean I still there's there's encouraging solidarity happening here but yeah, it does seem like uh, a smaller group of the the greater whole that we definitely need to try to encourage yeah. more people to to join in to maybe with more people understanding like the the real situation as as you you know people from the UK if they came here and they saw mm -hmm. um. A, the kind of people that we're talking about, which are not, um, they've got no intention of causing any harm. Well, it's the thing, it's like, they're, yeah. they're determined, they're, they're, they've, they've traveled halfway around the world, yeah. Um, yeah. just looking for an opportunity to um, to thrive, really. And, well, and it's the thing you hear from people over and over again, that, I mean, it's not just like something people say on the news, but like something people say in, in quiet conversation or private conversations to you that like I wouldn't have left my country if I had any other choice you know like I exactly just looking for a safe place to be a place where they can feel welcome and it's just up to us whether we we do welcome people and we, we do make a little bit more more space with the with the resources that we uh, we have I met quite a few people as I've been here over the week mm -hmm. and I just feel inspired <laughs> by mm -hmm. there. Um, you know, there are lots of you know, young men, young um, young adults mm -hmm. um, traveling like from Sudan and and um, they, they just kind of see it unstoppable, you know, in their determination to mm. yeah, it's, it's to a... find a better life. And, wow. um, yeah, and often happy to, 
So, if you're asking me about England, what's yeah. England like? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. There's a guy who wanted to go to Manchester, and I told him, you do know it rains a lot in Manchester. Wow. But, yeah, a little like Kelly. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think as well, um, something that I've talked with a few of the groups around and with Marie, um, about children, that children, um, they pick up languages quickly and, and it feel, I've always felt like that there's, there's some hope in, um, he, a child moves into a different, um, country or, um, a different culture and that child then becomes a link, um, between those cultures. Yeah. And, um, even having both of the cultures inside of them. Really, yeah. They're, they're really like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's. So that's that kind of makes me hopeful, you know, like that when I see that, just uh, how how people have adapted. But this also on the other side of that is that that they've they've been in many cases forced to to grow up quickly. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, it's. But they're definitely resilient, and. Well, it, it's both. I mean, that's that's the thing is that, I think sometimes you know, we want to paint refugees as either either really vulnerable or really resilient but like they're both and you see i mean like it's amazing the, the the things people have been through and that they continue to be open themselves that like it, it and that they're i mean it's really some of the like yeah some of the kindest uh most generous hospitable people i've ever met are are the people that have gone through these incredible traumas and have faced so much rejection mm -hmm. On this you know, institutional level, you know, personal, kind of xenophobic, racist kind of things, but then that they continue to be open. I think, I think it's it's it shows us that we have that inside of us too. We we can we can be that too. Like we we have the the opportunity. We just have to have to open open our hearts a, a little bit. But it, it's I mean we're all we're all human. That's that's the thing. We're all people, and I mean it's a shocking reality here. It's not it's a couple of hours from London, a couple of hours from Paris, from Brussels, these major European capitals. And like the, the things where, you know, like police take away people's shoes and, and make them walk barefoot for hours and hours through the night or people drinking out of, you know, the flood water because uh, they don't have access to water or police marking people with numbers on their hand, you know, people coming back to the houses with, being reduced to a number or not being allowed to ride on the bus when it's free for everybody else. I mean, just these, these things that I think it's, it's important that like we together, you know, no matter where you are, what, what time you have, I mean, maybe you don't have time, but you have a little extra um, resources to, to support people. It's just so important that we have, have a voice to say to people that, no, that, I mean, the, the, the structure that we've, created that's not that's not what I feel mm -hmm. um, that's not what I want to communicate to you I want to say to you you're very welcome here you know just like they say to us so many times or whatever, you know. um, I think I think that's the, the thing I'd like like for people to know
<laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Can I just grab my water?